All right, everybody, this is Cam McGowan. Hi, everyone. So, Red Letter Day, man. Yeah, that's my movie. Congrats. Thank you. So when is it playing? It's playing at Globe Cinema October 26th until November 1st. You can see it. Thanks. Come down to the Globe. Seriously, there will be B-roll playing right now. So you can <laughs> see the poster and this amazing theater that I like gush over. Every time I like think of movies in Calgary or anything that I've done, it's like this is this is the place. Yeah, man. I love it. We're lucky to still have it. I know. So you have been affiliated with Calgary Underground Film Festival, Calgary yeah. International Film Festival. How long? Kind of. Well, I just show, I screen at the Calgary International. I program at the Calgary Underground. Okay. So how did that, how did that come? Cuff? Uh, well, I love what Cuff was doing. Uh, they were bringing a lot of cool movies here. I was like their number one fanboy. And um, so I would email Brenda whenever there was a movie I wanted to make sure they were considering for Cuff. Yeah, yeah. And so it was like one or two here and there, but then it ended up becoming like lists of like 20, to 25 and she was like, why don't you just come join the team? I was like, okay, cool. And so I started just watching shorts as a previewer, that's the position, because um, film festivals get somewhere between 500 to 4,000 short films submitted. So you need a group of people that watches those and just says good or bad so that the actual yeah, yeah. programmers can then watch them and decide what the package would be. Okay. So I started doing that and um, I just really enjoyed it because as a filmmaker, it was really cool to get to see all of the work that was being made, not just the work that was being shown, yeah. but all of the types of movies that were being made. And I would start to notice certain trends in terms of uh, what worked and what didn't work. And it really helped inform my writing. And so uh, the more work I did with Cuff, the higher I worked my way up through the ranks. And now I'm the lead programmer there, nice. but also the better my films became. So. I was making short films before I previewed for yeah. Cuff, and they weren't screening anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Like I was getting one or two film festivals, but then after I learned what works and what doesn't in short films, um, my movies started to do way better. And so I had a short film called Liebe Love, that's like a troll romance in German, that uh, played over 25 film festivals, and that was all a result of me kind of figuring out what helps make a short film play internationally and uh, what helps make it enjoyable. What is that? Is there like a secret sauce? There is a secret sauce, yeah. Under nine minutes, under five minutes if possible. Keep it punchy and with like one direct concept. Everybody makes short films, well not everybody. It's a rookie mistake to make a short film as though it's the only movie you're ever gonna get to make. Yeah, for sure. And so a lot of people will cram in all the themes that are important to them and they got characters representing all the parts of their personality or people that they know right. and they just become too convoluted and too um, long, essentially. And so it's best to stick to one POV and try to keep it punchy, but also have what I like to say is two oh shits and one oh fuck. So nice. you got oh shit, okay. Oh, oh shit, oh fuck, the end. <laughs> and then people remember it and they'll go, all right, let's program I, that. I 100% agree with that. Like, <laughs> I don't know if it's like from being drumming or something, like movies always have to hit like, certain crescendos for me, like little yeah. little impact points for the audience to be like, whoa, and then impact, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you gotta, you gotta, get, them, you gotta get them hooked, and, uh, they're so, and especially in today's day and age when people are used to watching short form content more than ever, yeah. uh, the shorter the better. Like, unless it's an absolute masterpiece and you have a huge budget for it, and it's been your baby for many years, I mean, because a lot of the short films that get nominated for Academy Awards are quite long. Like whenever I get that piece of advice, people are like, well, X is 20 minutes long. And I'm like, yeah, but that's a masterpiece. Not everyone's out there making masterpieces. Yeah, sure. Most of us are just making pretty good movies. And if you're making a pretty good movie, keep it, keep it short if you want it to play. So how hard was it to transition from short films to the feature length? You know, it's funny. It wasn't actually the, that hard for me because I'd um, been making short films with the same group of people for so long yeah. that it was more like uh, a camp summer camp. Yeah. yeah, or it was just fun. Like it was like it was just like, hey guys, we got another adventure. Uh, it's like a D and D campaign or something. It's like, hey guys, we got another challenge that we have to uh, overcome together. And um, so it was just longer is all it was. And I'm pretty good at um, scheduling and keeping my days relatively short. So there was never any burnout from uh, shooting for too long. I think there was one day where we went over 12 hours and that was unfortunate, but we only had the location for the one day. 
But yeah. other than that, it was just like making five to ten short films back to back to back with this group of uh, friends that had become kind of like family. You know, That's awesome. Yeah. So I, I love that word challenges because like for me, filmmaking is just a whole bunch of challenges that you have to overcome and yeah. like make decisions all the time. What were like some of the challenges that, you know, came up? Making well, this? Red Letter Day, we had a relatively small, we had a very small budget uh, compared to what most folks are used to make movies for. But for what I was used to making movies for, it was just right, a little less than we could have used, but it was pretty nice. Uh, I mean, it's most money I ever had to work with, so yeah, for sure. it was great to even get to make a film. But the challenges that arose were mostly from a shoot, uh, shoot, short shooting schedule. We only had 15 days to make the movie because of uh, how much okay. money we had. And a lot of those days were spent with stunts or with gore. And so stunts and gore take a long time. And so the longer you take with those, the less you have, less time you have for the other they scenes. They turned out so good. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Who did the special effects? They were unbelievable. Uh, there was a dude named Stacy Wagner, who I used to work with at Bleeding Art Industries in town. Yeah, I've always been like a horror nut. And so um, one of my first jobs outside of film school was working in the warehouse of Bleeding Art Industries. So I started just by sweeping. And then eventually they, I was on set as like a bowl stand-in. Oh no, a buffalo stand-in. <laughs> and I helped blow some stuff up and we did, I don't think we'd ever did any blood effects while I was there, but there was a dude named Stacy who I bonded with over horror films and he became really good at uh, visual effects. I mean, as our career paths separated, I only worked there for about three or four months, but he stayed there for a couple of years and then yeah. went on to do his own thing, work on stuff like Power Rangers and a lot nice. of horror shit. And so, um, yeah, we just came back together after all those years and uh, actually the gore stuff was, after the script was finished, I immediately went to work planning the visual effects, the gore stuff shots, because as a horror fan, if I only ever get to make one movie, I want it to be something that I can watch in 10 years, but yeah, that pretty much sums up the type of movie I dreamed of making. And so uh, knowing that we didn't have much money, I had the luxury of time um, before we even got to casting. And so I was like, okay, let's plan out these gore effects, because as a horror fan myself, I know that horror fans are wanting cool, practical, creative, practical shit. Practical, like yeah, that is practical. what is missing in, I, I don't think people are doing it as well as they used to, like right? Yeah, you need time for practical effects, right? Because they often go wrong. And so you either need to be prepared to go with the flow of a shot going wrong or have the time to do it again. I don't want to spoil anything, but that, that such high points in this movie were all the special effects. I was like losing my mind. Oh, cool. Yeah, we had, we had to do two digital blood enhancement effects. Um, but I mean, that's all right. Two is better than 100, so. I didn't, I couldn't notice. Because all the practicals were so freaking well. Oh, yeah, thanks, dude. All right. Uh, what made you pursue filmmaking, especially in horror, like the horror genre? Was there any like kind of inception point in your life that is like, oh my God, this is it, I have to go in this direction now? When I was a kid, I would binge watch movies. Um, Blockbuster and other video stores yeah. used to have like six movies for seven nights for 10 bucks or whatever. And um, so I would just rent whatever. Like this is for the internet, so you had to roll the dice a lot. I mean, yeah, I would just watch anything. And, um, but then, you know, I started reading some books and magazines about movies and started to figure out that, hey, actual people write these things. They're not just, you know, tele transportations of cosmic images from someone's <laughs> mind into yours. It's like someone writes these and someone chooses what you see. And I was like, I want to be that person. And so I would always dream of like, okay, what would I do? Was there like, I was making this movie. Was there like one director or filmmaker in particular that was like, oh my God, like, I love that style. I need to figure out. Yeah, yeah, it was Sam Raimi for sure. It was yes. like, uh, I watched Army Darkness all the time. Yes, and so did I. <laughs> when they had all those flashbacks, I was like, wait a second, like, these don't look like they're from the same movie. Because it was called Army Darkness, yeah. right? It's not, I mean, it is Evil Dead 3, but as a kid, you just know it as Army Darkness. And then I'm like, I think that th there's another movie that those other shots are from. So uh, I found Evil Dead 2. I was like, I got to just see what this director made before. And I found Evil Dead 2. I'm like, oh my God, this is even better than Army of Darkness. And then that was the first director that I became like obsessed with making sure that I watched all of their movies like multiple times. It was, it was cool because he was a dude who was making these movies 
outside of Hollywood. Yeah. And they were getting seen by people all over the world. And they had, it was because they had so much creativity and heart and um, passion behind the scenes and a unique voice, like a unique POV. And that was when I was like, oh, that's what a director does. I mean, that's what I want to fucking do. Like, I, I want to be the same Raimi. Um, and then, you know, that's when Quentin Tarantino was coming out. And, yep. and Kevin Smith and Spike Lee. It was all these American independent filmmakers coming out, like bursting at the same time, coming out of seemingly nowhere. And as a kid, that was very inspiring. So. What inspired you to make the film be a daytime horror movie? I love, I just love that idea because it's so much scarier. You, you can't get away, right? Yeah, well, thanks, man. That's awesome. Um, I like the juxtaposition of like colorful suburban life, like bright blues, whites, pastels, with crashing reds just pouring in. It's called Red Letter Day. So yeah. once the letters show up, it's the only red you've seen in the movie so far. And when there's blood, it's the only red you see outside of the letter. So it really created this visual juxtaposition that uh, was appealing to me and my cinematographer, Rep Miller. And so um, it was funny because I was writing. I was writing a lot of scripts at the time because um, I had I was sitting on this um, investment from Tanda Films, uh, Trevor and Amy Griffith, who um, really had faith in me as a filmmaker. They liked my short films and they were close friends and they said, we want you to make whatever you want. And so, uh, I mean, that's a lovely thing to hear, but it's also really daunting because it's like, yeah. that's the only stipulation is whatever I want. And so I wrote about four scripts for that amount of money. And what, happened was the first few were just too big like it was like I, if i made this for the budget we have it, i would not it would not look good. like it yeah like it would be ambitious certainly but we wouldn't <laughs> be able to get to that sweet for spot sure, yeah and so for the fourth script i was like i love human hunting human movies and i grew up as a kid in the burbs just feeling the ominous pressure of you know going for a walk and knowing you're surrounded by people but not being able to see them just the anxiety that comes with you know, what, what's happening behind that door? What's happening behind that door? Like, any kind of weird stuff could be happening. And since I never see these people, <laughs> I would never know. And so I really became obsessed with that idea. And it was right around the time of the um, Trump election where everybody seemed to be turning on each other. Everybody was That's, calling each was other his, names. That was his whole campaign. Yeah. Just like, you hate this person, so do I. Yeah, but then everybody else started doing it. And it's like, and so everybody was just name calling. And I was like, the great thing with the Burbs is that everybody comes from different backgrounds. Yeah. And so there's not like, you know, one type of culture in the suburbs. And so if there came a time where, you know, um, there was a polarizing subject, the Burbs is where the arguments would happen, where the clash, the culture clash would happen. And so I was like, okay, how do I like, magnify that <laughs> by like a thousand like so I came up with this Twilight Zone concept but it's very much rooted in the us first them mentality that already exists in the suburbs for sure but then also what was happening in politics at the time um, I mean it's still happening unfortunately and then mixing that with my human hunting human love I was like I, it has to be in the daytime like <laughs> it just has to be because then I can get the social satire in there that I love so much and um because I I'm a huge fan of the dark comedies of the 80s, like Heathers or Beatles yeah, yeah, yeah. or the Burbs. And um, a lot of those would, you know, kind of amplify the kookiness of uh, daytime oddities. I love how it unfolds, like the, the slow burn of like, they're not capable of that, but are they? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second, am I? Yeah, oh my yeah. goodness. And then it just, oh. It, it's yeah, perfect. thanks, dude. Yeah, because I really wanted a family that you're like, oh, these are just cool, nice people. What could go wrong here? Well, especially like, I, I loved the crowd because I saw it here. It's filmed in Calgary. Yeah. And to see it with the hometown crowd, like, it, it, it just felt, it felt amazing to see it, like, with everyone involved in the movie. Yeah, that was an exciting movie. It felt really nice. So how has it been touring it around the world and, like, all the different crowds and everything? It's How's weird, it man. It's really weird because I made this movie for myself friends um, and you know uh, as a culmination of all of my experience up to this point and the fact that it's showing in Germany and Mexico and Brazil and Brussels and the UK it's just it's it's crazy it's like I never thought that people outside of Calgary would watch this movie 
I, I just wanted to make the best movie that I, I could make at that time. And so now that we're like playing these major horror festivals and being compared to movies that have like 50 times our budget, yeah, yeah. it's really scary. Like it's like now critics are watching my movie as though it's like- Is that scary? It's so you? scary. It's like, cause you, like people are watching it as though it's just another movie. They're not- That's amazing though. It is, it's totally amazing, but it's also like, I had I had limitations while making it. For sure, I didn't have the resources that a lot of these other movies do, yeah. and so I'm being not not being compared to them, and it's it's frightening because it's like, like I I know that there's certain things I wish I could have done better in the film, but it simply wouldn't have been possible. Well, yeah. And so now uh, it's just out there for folks to to judge as they see fit. So I've had to stay off the internet. I just I can't oh, really? I can't read what other people say, man, because it's like to me it's perfect for what we had. Yeah, 100%. Um, and the next one, if I get to make another movie, it'll definitely be better. But I love it. And it's like sending my child out to school, but not to like a local suburban school. Like the school <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. where there's like rich kids. And like, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. like, oh my God, my poor kid. <laughs> I hope they're nice to it. <laughs> Do you have anything else like on the go right now? Yeah, well, I just had my first child, Arthur Campbell Miller, and so he's been a handful, but uh, it's been awesome. But my brain's just been completely rewired and focused on that little dude while we're uh, wrapping up getting the movie released. So we've sold the distributor, Dread. Nice. And so we're going to have a Blu-ray in November, so we've been uh, doing special features for the Blu-ray. We've got some theaters that are playing the movie, and we're still getting into film festivals. That's amazing. Yeah, I just got invited to one. In Los Angeles, called Screen Fest. Yes, yeah. kind of a big deal. Screen Fest is a very big deal. Yeah, and so we would just played Fright Fest in the UK, and now we're doing oh Screen God. Fest in LA. So all the horror nerds are now watching our little movie. I'm just like, oh, please, I hope you like it. <laughs> like, which we worked so hard. I don't know how. <laughs> honestly, that those holy fuck moments that you're talking about hit so hard right in your face. Like, I don't know how they couldn't. Yeah. Like, you got to see it with the crowd. Yeah. Like, even when it's on demand, or you got that Blu-ray, like. Bring some friends over, order a pizza, get some beer. It was made for that. <laughs> That's honestly why I had to do this video and I have to talk to you because I feel like I want people to see this film. Like yeah, it's, it's something really special. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. <laughs> Seriously, dude, thank you so much for doing this interview. Uh, it means a lot that you uh, took time out of your day to sit down with me and talk Red Letter Day. I set up this interview with him at the Globe and everything went wrong. <laughs> the audio, I had his lab, it ended up going to a weird static channel. Didn't end up uh, sounding, well, it was just completely static. Um, when I went to go check to see if we were in focus, I bumped the lens and put us completely out of focus and I didn't have my monitor that day so I couldn't see that the popcorn machine behind us was in focus. The audio was so terrible. I'm sorry. Such a cool movie, guys. Make sure you check it out. Uh, I'll have a link in the description where you guys can check it out uh, locally and uh, once there is a link to the Blu-ray, I'll make sure to put that in the description as well. That's all I got for today, guys. Thank you so much for stopping by. We'll see you next time.